Hello, readers in the Read Podcast universe. Welcome to the Read Podcast, the research education advocacy podcast, where we connect you with researchers, educators, and thought leaders on topics in education and child development. Read is produced by the Winward Institute. I'm your host, and I am joined by a researcher whose work I truly admire for quite some time and who is a leader in the field of reading education, Dr. Elsa Cardenas Hagen. Dr. Hagen, welcome to the Read Podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be here today. Oh, yeah, yeah, me too. I'm so excited to have you on. I know you said you were excited, but how, I just want to know first, how are you showing up to this conversation? What are your hopes or key ideas that you want to highlight in our time together? Well, I think it's essential that every teacher out there in classrooms, any every interventionist, really be prepared to understand students who are learning English as an additional language with the hopes of gaining multiliteracy, that this is all possible, but we have to be strategic and comprehensive in our approach. And I hope today we'll cover some of that in our discussion. Excellent. I love that. The strategic and comprehensive. I'm going to hold on to those two words. So I do want to read your formal bio to introduce our read listeners to you. So Dr. Elsa Cardenas Hagen is a bilingual speech language pathologist and a certified academic language therapist. She holds a doctorate degree in curriculum and instruction and is the president of Valley Speech Language and Learning Center in Brownsville, Texas, and is an associate research professor for the Texas Institute for Measurement, Evaluation, and Statistics at the University of Houston. I love statistics, so this is exciting. Elsa's research interests include the development of early reading assessments for Spanish-speaking students, in addition to the development of reading interventions for bilingual students. She was the co-principal investigator of a longitudinal study funded by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development and the Institution for Education Science, examining the oracy and literacy development in English and Spanish of Spanish-speaking children, which we will link in the episode bookmarks on the Read Podcast website. Elsa currently serves as the vice chairperson of the International Dyslexia Association, chairperson of the National Joint Committee on Learning Disabilities, and was a past board member of the National Academic Language Therapy Association. And she has authored curricular programs, book chapters, and journal articles related to oracy and literacy development for English language learners. Truth be told, we are about to learn a lot from you. So I am so excited. So as we start, Elsa, in your own words, I'd like to know more about your story and your professional journey. Okay. So, you know, that's really, I usually do not talk about myself, but I am, you know, my parents, my father is from Mexico. My mother family came from Spain. And so our family grew up speaking Spanish. However, when I entered school, we did not have the opportunity of bilingual education. Uh, And so our parents were encouraged to only speak English to us. And in the school, we were also punished for speaking our home language in the playground, in the classroom. And it was, you know, just pretty terrifying. And Luckily, by the time I reached middle school, they offer foreign language. And then I got to show all that I knew in another language and really thrived and continued that journey all through, you know, junior high school, high school, into college, went to study further linguistics in Spain, went to Mexico to study some more. And it was all for personal, for personal benefit, just to really, you know, thrive in my language, my culture. Culture, the linguistics of the language. And now today I get to use all that information in my work. And what we hope today is that all students are honored as, you know, that they have such assets that they bring to our classrooms and that we have to honor the language and the culture and honor that, wow, we have such a great resource in speaking more than one language. And let's really capitalize on those resources. Mm, I love that. Thank you for taking us on the journey there. And I like how you talked about honoring the home language and capitalizing on these resources. And I think I wanted to start with the reading brain, but I want to actually, now I'm talking out loud as I'm thinking about this. I actually want to start on on what you talked about, honoring the the resources and capitalizing on the resources, because I think it brings up a good point, right? And in past conversations on the Read podcast, and now in this current one, we 
constantly seek to broaden the research and educational implications for supporting all readers and all learners. And so I wanted to start by setting up the statistics of English language learners in the United States. And for our read listeners, I understand there are listeners in 120 plus countries listening around the world, um, but we are focusing, you know, obviously we are recording from the, from the United States and focusing on children who are speaking a different native language, who are acquiring English and learning to read English. And in the United States, according to the NCTQ, the National Council of Teacher Quality, there's over 5 million English language learners in public student schools around the United States. There are 30, that is actually a 35% increase over the last two decades. And uh, Dr. Hagen, I think, I, I'm not sure if this is still true, but they say 80% are Spanish speakers and the second is Arabic. Is that still hold true? Yes. And and what we also know is that how they're serviced in schools. So as you mentioned, you're talking about what is the, you know, what is the primary kind of system that we have here in the United States? And, you know, these students are representing about 10 percent of that school population. But, you know, the other languages, you're right, it's Arabic, uh, Vietnamese, um, you know, Chinese. And no matter the language, each of these languages, right, has its own structure. And each of these individuals that represent these languages also have their own culture. And it's up to us as educators to really, you know, understand and know about our students. We don't have to know their language, but we must know something about its structure. And we must be good at trying to uncover and discover what kind of connections can we make so that these students can strive and that they can feel very much a part of the school community. We need to do better on our school to home connections, you know, really engage our families. But as we look at this, you know, and we look across the United States, we are, we're concerned that our students are not reading proficiently. And, you know, there's this thing called the nation's report card that, you know, describes fourth graders and eighth graders and how, the, if you know, how many are proficient. And, you know, we have you know, very so for non-English learners, about 37% are proficient or above. But if you're an English learner, it's 10%. And by the way, we blame things on the pandemic. You know, for the English learner, that was the case in 2019, before the 2020, um, you know, really pandemic hit this country. And um, and and it stayed the same. We didn't lose ground um, when we looked in 2022, where in the non-English learners, we lost about two percentage points. And some people will say, well, that's just not a fair test. It's not a fair look. Well, we have to we have to understand something. And why why should we understand? And what this is what I often talk about, you know, folks, I don't want to screen. We don't want to over identify these students. Absolutely, we don't. But we have to know why do we screen? Why do we measure anything? It's because I need to know that so I can design my instruction so I can be diagnostic and prescriptive in my teaching. I'm not going to diagnose a young children, child in kindergarten or first grade with any kind of reading disability. But I'm going to look and see how are they faring along their, you know, compared to their peers and how does that inform our school and what we need to be doing more of and more intentionally and purposefully. And so I know lots of people out there are worried about, you know, this over identification, which it has happened in our history. Don't get me wrong. It has happened. But I think more in these last, you know, 15 years, it hasn't been so much about the over identification. It's been about the under identification and, and not enough service to these students in, in a comprehensive manner. Mm, yeah, those are all really good points. And um, I do want to touch on screening and I want to talk, touch on the comprehensive instruction. And for you mentioned students across a lot of different languages, and we'll talk about the research, the solid research, well documented over decades on the importance of explicit systematic instruction for students learning English. Right. And you talk about structured by literacy. So I do want to get to those two points. Um, so even with diverse languages and cultures, that's the instruction that is working for students who are learning to read English. But I wanted to, to, to pull back to the reading brain. You talked about English, you talked about Arabic, you talked about Vietnamese. What I was interested to actually learn about in my own research from an educator is that 
each of these languages, some of them have certain similar features and some of them don't. So perhaps from an educator perspective, what, what is different or similar about certain features of languages and why would that be important for the classroom? Yeah, so as we look, um, you know, uh, first of all, the foundation of reading is language. And if we look at language, um, no matter where you live in the world, uh, children uh, are exposed, uh, humans are meant to speak, children are exposed to language, and there's certain kind of developmental milestones, would you say, that are pretty universal, that young children begin to talk, they begin to say their first words by you know, one year and put two words together. And we have to be mindful of that because as your language develops, these are the precursors to reading because reading is language based. And we talked about language being a natural process, humans being able, you know, to communicate orally, right? And then we talk about reading as not being such a natural process, right? But reading is language based. And so that's why it's so important to have strong language skills to support those strong lit literacy skills, to get to strong literacy skills. And as we develop those strong literacy skills, what I want to say about that is then that supports, you know, really that development of academic, further academic language. So your literacy can support your language and your language can support your literacy skills. And so as we look at that and we think about the brain, there are certain centers in the brain primarily in that left hemisphere hemisphere that are responsible for us to, you know, take in the language for us to understand what we're listening to and for us to express ourselves, you know? And when we look at reading, we see some of those same centers activated, especially when we look at alphabetic languages. Now, languages that are more pictographic, right? We see that, oh, you know, these pictographic languages, oh, there's some activation, uh, not only in the left, but we see some activation in the right for really, you know, because uh, a lot of those were, de you know, depending on a lot of visual uh, translating that picture, right, um, to uh, meaningful um, units of uh, language. And so, but no matter what, we still, even in those languages that are pictographic, it's still necessary for individuals to be able to process the sounds. We call that ability the phonological processing. And if we're thinking about how it applies to reading, that applies to your phonological awareness. We have to transcribe that print that's on the page, whether that be in, in an alphabetic alphabetic or more logo graphic, right? And we have to apply meaning to it. And what happens, for example, for students that might have a reading disability, um, such as dyslexia, they may have difficulty in that phonological component of the language, which then affects their ability to read that print and, um, and be able to write and spell. Mm. Thank you for breaking that down for us. And I think that's really important for teachers across, you know, any classroom working with students across any language to understand those mechanisms. And um, as we then think about instruction, what I loved first is when you, when I asked you where you were showing up today, I felt this sense of excitement and empowerment, right? And in, in working with the students, um, with all students, right? And specifically students that are um, multilingual. And so we are going to talk about this comprehensive approach, but I want to start with the strengths, right? When I hear empowerment, I think of a strengths-based approach. So approach. <laughs> so what strengths do students who are multilingual or speak another language other than English have prior to formal reading education in English language? So what we have to understand is they bring the strengths from their home, their home environment, what they've been exposed to. They bring the strengths now of when they come into your classroom, they already have a set of language skills, right? And, uh, you know, so they have a sound system. Uh, they have a meaning system, right? They have a communication style, uh, often what we call that pragmatic language uh, uh, capabilities. And they have this, and they, they have this way of, you know, putting and expressing their language. So they already have a structure. And so when we think about language, every language 
in the world has a structure and that structure involves the sound system, right? The words and the meaning system uh, for some, in some many cases, there's smaller units of meaning uh, in a language that also uh, can be very beneficial for reading, but they also have the way they use their language, you know, words and how words can go together to make cohesive sentences, how we express ourselves, how we take turns, how we initiate a conversation. You know, we have to be aware that different languages and cultures have certain rules that are sometimes the unspoken rules. And then we put get ourselves in this new system where, by the way, the majority in this country, the United States of America, the majority of these students who have a home language other than English are primarily serviced in English medium classrooms. I would love for us to have dual language classrooms across the United States. We just don't right now have that. We don't have the human capital to deliver that. So what can we do in our instruction to meet the needs of these students and to realize that they do have a language. It has a structure. It has a way it operates and works. And how can we capitalize upon that as we put an additional language system and literacy system on top of what they bring to our classroom? Mm. Yeah, I read some research. I think um, it was Bronham Martin et al. 2012 that students who have a strong phonological awareness skills in their native language are likely to have strong phonological awareness skills in their second language. And I think that's important, that's right? right? Knowing that there are those structures, those systems and rules they already bring. And again, what I hear you talk about is this integrated approach of, of not marrying. I don't like that word, marrying. Of <laughs> bringing, I often sometimes will say different things on the podcast. I'm like, I hate that. I don't like the way I describe that word. So let me try that again. So when you talk about this integrated approach, you're um, bridging the oral strengths and capacities, the written linguistic, and then the cultural elements. I, I want to talk about this two, this multi prong approach, but starting with the bridging of the oral written. Um, linguistic elements. And you obviously integrate the findings of the National Reading Panel in, in your re research and um, incorporating the systematic explicit instruction. But I've heard you go further in this structured by literacy. So can you help us to flesh out and break down what you mean by structured by literacy to help children access the written language in English? Right. So you mentioned, um, so Lee, Brown and Martin, actually he was at the University of Houston. So that was in kind of some of the same sets of, of it was in the same sets of students that we were working for interventions of those same students that are in those studies to describe how phonological awareness, um, you know, operates across languages. It's those often those same set of students where we actually did interventions with those students. And so I can talk to you about what, and, and those interventions were when we found them at risk. But what's very important to realize is that, uh, as I said, we have an oral language. And so Spanish is the most common uh, language spoken in the homes of these students who are, you know, uh, classified nationally as English learners. And when we look at that and we look at the Spanish language, it's a very what we call transparent language, meaning that you know, it's very regular. It has five vowels. They never change. We've got these consonants. They're pretty reliable. Whereas in English, all the vowels have more than one sound. And um, we have lots of different parent, uh, you know, patterns. And we borrowed from so many different languages. But in there, so Spanish has about, some will say 22 phonemes. Some will say up to 24 phonemes. English has 44 phonemes. Some will say up to 46. No matter how you look at it, English has more phonemes than most languages. And so, but what we have to do is understand that, you know, since so much transfers, and then that study you're mentioning, it was like 0.92 between Spanish and English on this, you know, sound system. So I'm about 0 0.08 off from it being a perfect correlation. But what does that 0 0.08 possibly relate to? Well, we've got all these new sounds in the English language. Oh, ah, you know, er, and, and we have to, you know, first understand that there's connections to be made orally through the phonological component of the language. Um, we have to make those connections when we think about uh, through the, you know, the words and their meanings, the vocabulary, you know, uh, English, uh, you know, is 60 percent 
based upon Latin, another 15% on the Greek. And so between the Latin and Greek, you know, we have about 75% of our language. And so there's so much from a language such as Spanish that is Latin based that we can contribute to English and really help the students soar in vocabulary and their ability to express themselves. And then that we can put into the written language, but we have to understand that, as I said, there's already a structure. And, you know, for example, we have typical writing patterns and speaking patterns that are not atypical. It's just us overgeneralizing from our home language to the second language, which is a part of second language and second language literacy development. So we capitalize upon that. We celebrate it. We let the students know, good for you. You said this, and that is beautiful. I understood you. And there's a little bit of a difference in this English language. It works like this, right? So it's honoring when the student speaks to us, when the student it reads to us when the students write that we're looking at those patterns, that we're celebrating that overgeneralization because that's a part of that second language and second language literacy, but development. And first, we have to know the why behind the what that we see in front of us. And when we look across our country, you know, less than 3% of teachers are really qualified to work, you know, across these languages with this true specialization in how to meet the needs of these students learning English as an additional language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the 3% is, I want to something I want to touch on, especially with the recent NCTQ report. I want to circle back to what you said about vocabulary, um, because in in learning about um, teaching English learners, I had read that even if a student is reading English with like fluently, right? That we should not necessarily assume that they're comprehending, right? And is comprehension being the goal of reading. You talked about vocabulary. Should there be a greater emphasis on building that vocabulary and comprehension? And what are those elements in structured biliteracy or in other ways to foster that? Right. So what we see is teachers spend about 30% of their day on oral language, but it's not well-designed, intentional, authentic, purposeful. Um, In the United States, we have these practice guides from the Institute for Education Sciences uh, practice guides. And we have one in particular that's really looking at the academic language and content knowledge of these students in the uh, you know, upper elementary grades into the, you know, middle school grades. And what we find is, yes, you know, let's get a set of these words, these academic words, and let's create these multiple opportunities for use across the content areas, right? And for these students, uh, some of the best word learning strategies are to really capitalize on what we call our cognates. And these are words that are similar across um, languages that look um, the same and similar in spelling, similar in meaning. And I often give the example of the word canoe uh, uh, and finding that, wow, look, I can see this very same word in English and in Spanish and Catalan. I can see it in German. I can see it in French, right? I even saw it in Vietnamese and I could figure out that that was canoe. So can we capitalize upon that and capitalize upon, for example, in the Spanish language, (laughs) we use words that are very high level academic words in English. And I'll give you an example. When my son was in high school, he came home and he goes, hey, mom, what does the word placate exactly mean? And I turned to him and I told him in Spanish, I make when the mommy te dice aplacate. It's a word that we use every day, like, hey calm down, right? And we use we use the word placate. In English, you use the word calm. So we use very high level fancy words, but it's not just knowing that we use it. It's making the connections in an intentional manner and teaching our students that this is a strategy for them. Think about, you know, does this exist in my home language and what connection can I make? That's up to us as educators to capitalize. But these are some very good word learning strategies. And also looking at what I called earlier, those morphemes and morphological awareness. And I call when you work across those languages, 
meta morphological awareness, because you're not only thinking in one language, we're always thinking across languages, right? And so just capitalizing on that kind of metalinguistic skill and teaching our students how we do that work so then they can generalize it and they can be independent one day and just trying to figure out what does this exactly say? And I've got to have, yes, the ultimate goal is reading comprehension, but for reading comprehension, you're right. I have to be able to read the print on the page accurately. I've got to be able to understand the words there. I have to have some kind of background knowledge and experience, right? So that I, you know, can make some kind of connection to the content of what I'm reading about. And I have to be active and strategic, always kind of monitoring my comprehension. But we want to teach the students how they can really foster, uh, we need to help them to foster these skills and we need to help them understand, you know, what a resource they have and uh, that they can use that to that development of high levels of comprehension in the second language. Hmm. I love all those pieces that you said. So what I hear you saying um, was providing insights of the cross-examination of cross-linguistic features, um, capitalizing on native language and context, developing the content goals and and things like that. And what I liked what you talked about with your son was that was an op- a micro opportunity of building some schema, right? And some background knowledge. Yes. And so yes, and I have one more story to tell you because oh, that was in high school. And I was told when I was a very young person and I the person that told me I was wrong is still is my best friend today, one of my best friends, a very famous researcher that I, you know, just a, such a mentor, but um you know, when I started talking about doing this with young children, I was told, well, that was not developmentally appropriate. Young children can't do this. And I give the example of uh, now my son has, uh, you know, this four-year-old and, you know, he, we were at a restaurant. He goes, hey, look, I have a visor. And I go, yes. Do you know why it's called visor? It has V-I-S, vis in it, and O-R for you to see. He's like, oh, no, I didn't know that. And I go, remember, you went to the hospital, visit your great grandpa? You were the visitor. You went to see him. And look at me. What do I wear? Glasses to help what? My vision. And then the little four-year-old says, oh, Harry Potter. He wears a cloak. It's an invisible. When he wears the cloak, he is invisible. You cannot see him. That was a four-year-old putting together, you know, the morphology, having that opportunity in a naturalistic way. And we can do this across the content areas. There's so much opportunity in science classrooms and math when we're teaching science and math and social studies and language arts throughout that. So we have to make connection and it really works best when there's a central idea and then we can build these words from those central ideas. And doing this kind of work is a lot of fun and um, young students can do this work as well as older students. Oh, I love that. That's such a great story. The Harry Potter Invisible Cloak. Harry Potter. <laughs> and you know what this preschool, I would say he's in preschool and the principal would say, oh, I go into the classroom to look at these beautiful words that, you know, little Andrew can say. And I tell the director of the school, you know, uh, all children can do this work. He's just as smart as anybody else. And all the other children are just as smart. It's opportunity. Mm-hmm. It's that intentional opportunity. Yeah, that makes again, the difference. Harnessing the strengths and and seeing those connections. I love that. And again, what we're returning back to is building the schema and the background knowledge and making sure that we're, we are enabling as educators, students to make the connections from their home native language or the, na- the, the language they learned to speak first with then bridging it with learning the written language and reading. What about the reading writing connection? So at the word and sentence level, or even at the spelling level, what what elements of the reading writing connection are important as students develop skills for right. their second language? Right. So what we see uh, in looking and, you know, looking with uh, another researcher, we're just, I love looking at all these writing samples, but it's really so fascinating to observe um, from how students first, you know, from what they are able to communicate orally and how they put that into print, right? From speaking to writing. And what's so amazing is that you do see these patterns in their language. And 
it's almost like we want to say there's a stage, an extra stage of this overgeneralization before they get to that really formal uh, spelling and writing pattern. And uh, so we've developed like some rubrics on how to look at that and really understand, you know, what is that progression of the student. But what's fascinating about that is you can see their spoken language in that print and you can see the syntax as well. Well, you can see how, um, you know, wow, I understand exactly what this sentence says. Uh, the syntax differs a bit in this English language. Oh, we got to move this word, you know, in front of this word. And I give an example. So, you know, in the Spanish language, adjectives, right? follow the noun. And in the English language, the adjective is typically before the noun. And so you'll see kind of those uh, different patterns of that. But our students, um, in the classrooms really need to get those foundational skills of written language. And that really does involve, uh, you know, being able to, first of all, you know, mechanically, you know, write on the page. We know that handwriting, for example, I know when I'm writing and creating something, I do it by hand over the computer. We There's some studies that will show uh, the benefit of that. But I also have to look at that spelling and that grammatical component, but also understanding how the different text structures work and how we can scaffold that instruction step by step by step to create these wonderful, um, you know, uh, composition. Steve Graham talks a lot about how, you know, what we need in our classrooms and what we need in our interventions and how little time is truly dedicated to that. Recently, in one of our studies, we were looking at we were looking at the school day and how it was designed and it was not integrated. It was like, okay, we're going to do this part of reading. Let's say phonological awareness here. We're going to do phonics here. Then we're going to do, uh, you know, vocabulary and comprehension. And, oh, we don't have enough time for writing. We do that after school instead of listening, speaking, reading, and writing. So it's, that's what we mean by integrated, you know, so what, um, you know, we're going to have the opportunity to listen, we're going to have the opportunity to read, we're going to have the opportunity um, uh, to write about it and share what we're writing. And uh, Steve Graham talks also about the process of, you know, getting to that written composition. And we don't spend enough time on this. And perhaps, you know, it's like, oh, what gets taught you know, what gets taught is what gets tested or what gets tested gets taught. Um, and so I just hate that we're at that point, but we really need to do better. And so we work with these schools and school districts on let's really look at what you're doing and how we can be more strategic and streamline what we're doing and really think about listening is not one part and then reading another part, right? And then writing another part. No, it's the opportunity uh, together so that it's in integrated in what we do. And uh, we need to, uh, you know, really work towards teacher preparation, having that lots of opportunities. I think about speech and language pathology. Yeah. Uh, when we're in our training, you know, we get the opportunity to really practice our skills uh, in a setting that's supervised. And then when we come out and we've graduated, uh, we have, uh, you know, an extra nine months of mentorships where we have to demonstrate that we can implement these skills that we've learned about and we practice uh, and that we're able to really get to that. And so it's like we know about what people will call you know, the research base, the evidence base, or the science of reading. But what about that science of teaching and that implementation science? You know, we need so much more in that area. Yes. And that's something that gets me so excited. So jazz talk about the science of, te of teaching, being prepared to teach. I want to circle back to Steve Graham. Okay. We at the Windward School, Windward Institute, love Steve Graham, writing next, writing to read, and all that work of the reading, writing connection is so important. When you talked about the integration of reading, listening, oral language, and writing, it's true, right? You said time. I kept thinking of the intentionality of time, right? It is a finite resource. There's so much happening in our school day. But what you what you talked about really is, is being strategic about the time of of integrating content area instruction, of writing, of reading. And it really is when you see that 
explicit systematic instruction, I think of the cohesion and the coherence of curriculum as being fu- fundamental. So school leaders, teachers who are listening to this and thinking about, you know, oh, we have a piecemeal program that's not going to be as effective as what is that coherence of curriculum? So I love what you talked about that. The second piece I wanted to talk about in, in coming from explicit systematic instruction of, of advancing the science of reading in that way is then focusing on students with reading difficulties and disabilities. Let's say I have a child who is um, in preschool or pre-formal education. uh, And what I mean by that is they haven't been taught yet or explicitly taught to read and they're an English learner, right? And so your expertise is in screening and you talked a little bit about identification. So how do we leverage the screening practices and then subsequently, 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 the intervention for English learners who demonstrate a reading difficulty? Right. So first of all, I would like to say, and I uh, actually evaluate, you know, and have evaluated for getting, you know, more than 30 years, uh, young students and um What I want to alert you to, uh, what I want to describe is when students um, have issues, for example, you heard me talk about language as the foundation for reading. So when young students aren't speaking like the other students, their peers, when they're having trouble producing sounds, and not all sounds are are um, are in a child's repertoire at four or five. It's not until about the age of six to seven that they really get all the sounds of the language in place, right? Uh, but what we see, uh, for example, is that children that have these like speech sound disorders or are already having trouble understanding language that places them at risk for future reading difficulties. We do know that. And what what we have in this country is we, you know, have tools available in English, tools available, for example, in the language of Spanish. And now we're really thinking about, and I'm in a team of people that I'm just so honored to work with, that we're really trying to look at what we call a truly minimally, you know, bilingual, biliterate um, kinds of screenings. And now with new technology and uh, AI, you know, what are the possibilities? And so we're having those discussions, writing about it and, um, and really thinking about what the future will hold, that if we have enough in technology that can really understand through that, uh, you know, uh, what the child is saying and can we, you know, really capitalize about, about that and get a true, you know, minimally bilingual, biliterate score. Um, and so there's been a lot of work, in, you know, in speech and language looking at that and, and we're doing more in looking at that in, in reading And uh, then that way, it's not, you know, typically what happens in schools today is, okay, let me look at their native language score, their home language score. Let me look at their score in the second language. And you also have to look at what have been the opportunities, the language of instruction model. And and what we always do is look at, you know, what's the history, what's been the opportunity. But we want to understand and just to, the total child, you know, what have they had the opportunity for? What has been the language of instruction model, right? How are they responding? Are they responding in a bilingual, you know, biliterate manner? And if so, you know, we we give credit for that. We honor it. We understand it better. We know where they are. Uh, I think that's so important. And I give the example. So there's many things. There's been some, you know, kind of meta-analyses done of looking at, you know, what are those early signs and those early signs, you know, of, oh, guess what? You know, being able to, you know, tell me about, you know, what sound you hear at the beginning of the word or tell me about, uh, you know, can you, the rapid naming of of things. There's been some look at that uh, at uh, with students who are multilingual. Uh, but I think the future holds so much more, but we know enough to know, okay, here's these little things that we should be looking at in the early years. Um, and we, we, we find that and from researchers also across other countries, kind of that they're finding the same things as well. And as we're worried about over identification, you're not there to identify a preschooler or kindergarten student, um, 
for a reading disability, you're there to think about what? Teaching, teaching, teaching. And I only become fully concerned about that is when we teach, 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 and the students aren't responding as, you know, we think they should in comparison to their peers. And um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity. There's uh, some national funding, there's some private funding, and there's a bunch of projects going on right now in screening for these students. And so we're very pleased about that work, that opportunity, and um, it's exciting to see where we are now. And I think through technology, we're going to be able to do much better. Yeah. What I hear you saying, what I like what you're saying is using the screening and maybe leveraging the screening to allow the data to tell a story about that child. And um, I think that's something that's so empowering. So can you break down a couple of the elements of some of those pieces that would be important for screening? Right. So no matter it, you know, so we are so lucky to have, you know, screenings actually available in a language such as Spanish and languages uh, like um, English. And one of the things that um, we should know about is no matter the language, right. um, That when we look at that ability Um, that ability to, uh, you know, process the sounds and play with the sounds of the language, um, that, that is very, very important for future reading ability, right? And I mentioned that there's now like a meta-analysis, even looking at a rapid automatized naming amongst um, bilingual students and really seeing that that also, um, you know, can play a role in understanding uh, that, you know, future reading ability. Uh, Now, when we test really early um, uh, in um, very, very early, we do run the risk of you know, kind of over identifying because they really have it. That's why we've been having these discussions. Like, when would you do that? Would you do this kind of work like at the middle of the year? Because you know what they've received at the middle of like a preschool year, or do you do it at the beginning? But we know that that phonological awareness, that letter sound knowledge, that rapid automatized naming, and also even like kind of like short-term memory things. Those have been like some predictors of, uh, of you know, future uh, reading. But we also have to take into consideration what have been the environmental factors and the opportunities that these students have had, right? What have been that home language opportunity? What have been that language opportunity? Um, and what has been that phonological awareness opportunity? And that's why I worry about it. Like if we do it so early, are we more getting at, oh, this is just what we need to teach. And, you know, maybe that's what, you know, maybe that is what we need to teach. Um, So, you know, having those discussions about when is it best to do uh, that kind of thing. And as we know, if I'm testing in the home language, we know a lot of those skills transfer across languages, such as that phonological awareness, one that you mentioned, and there's been many studies on that and the letter sound knowledge for alphabetic languages, looking at here's this symbol and, you know, how does, how's that represented, um, you know, in print, but I have to have been taught that or had that opportunity. And, um, uh, the vocabulary, you know, what what have we learned about vocabulary? And so that vocabulary growth is going to be so important in that vocabulary ability for that future, you know, reading and reading uh, comprehension and listening comprehension and how that could apply to future reading comprehension. So I think, I think um, you know, we're really looking at that and we're trying to look more comprehensive, you know, in a more comprehensive manner, looking at, you know, the bilingual language experiences of the child versus the monolingual language experiences of the child, right? And we may initially, as, you know, coming from, you know, a culturally linguistically diverse background that, you know, we need to make sure that we're not, you know, misidentified because of our 
language experiences. And so that's why it's so important to get, you know, the knowledge of the environmental opportunities, the school opportunities. And we're also looking to see, you know, we know that a lot of these reading disabilities are, you know, they, they're hereditary, they, they run in families. And so can we look at that? So, uh, so young four-year-olds, you know, can we look at, you know, or a language, can we look at their listening comprehension? Can we look at whether they, you know, have any kind of, you know, phonological awareness skill you know, processing those sounds? And once we do, once we get to instruct, you know, are they responding to that? So it's really about teaching, teaching, teaching. And uh, we do a lot of testing, but we've got to link our teaching to that data. So data informs instruction. That's what we want it for, to inform our instruction. Mm. And what I hear you're saying, and this is as we're closing up our conversation, some key elements of teaching, 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 right? Is of having um, what the, the skills that educators need, right? of the, comp- the skill and competencies and explicit systematic instruction, the findings of the National Reading Panel, and really understanding the integrated approach of what that is. And then this, with all of, with this, right, and in the further integration of how we approach um, English learners is understanding those cultural and linguistic elements and being responsive to those cultural and linguistic elements, which I think is vital. It's not a uh, Yes, and it's there. It's it is a yes, and but but they're all equally important. Yeah. I think hopefully I'm I'm capturing that. And so my final question before I get to your exciting projects is, in the National Council on Teacher Quality, their recent report I think from this year, they showed that 71 percent of programs dedicate less than two instructional hours to teaching reading to English language learners, which means that most new teachers they said in the report enter classrooms without the knowledge and skills to teach English language learners to read. 71% dedicate less than two instructional hours. And you also, um, you, in, your, in the, this conversation, you talked about 3% of teachers are actually um, ready to teach ELLs. And you talked about the importance of practicum experiences. And so what insights can you give us, whether it's uh, skills and behaviors that you'd want to share of effective teachers, or just simply what other insights can you give us about the calls for teacher preparation and professional development in this specific yeah. area? So, as I said, I'd like for every teacher to understand a comprehensive approach to working with students, especially in, you know, we call it structured literacy. I come from the students I work with, it's structured multi literacy. What do I need? for the teachers to truly understand. I need them to understand that structure in two or more languages. And I need them to understand that they have to use, you know, cross-linguistic and cross-cultural features as a strategy throughout the day and everything that they do. So that means our teachers need to be prepared in understanding the speech sound system, right? In you know, minimally uh, two languages, understanding those structures and the most common languages such as English and Spanish. Um, you know, you talked about Arabic and Vietnamese and uh, forms like Mandarin as other languages, but understanding about how that speech bound system, uh, uh, you know, affects that print and how that print needs to be taught in that cross-linguistic manner and putting together understanding the syntax, understanding these wonderful opportunities for developing vocabulary, you know, the semantics to the cognates, the morphology, but understanding that our ultimate goal is for deep reading and effective written communication. But we never forget about using those culturally and linguistically responsive practices. Does culture teach me being culturally responsive? Does that teach me to read? No. What does it do? It engages me. It motivates me. The linguistic responsiveness? Absolutely. Yes. That makes an impact. But what we find is teachers, when they come into the classroom, they're not prepared for that. And we are really working diligently at, uh, you know, I'm involved in some other kind of nonprofit work in really working with state departments, uh, working with higher education uh, institutions on how to really ensure that we're comprehensive 
in our approach on how we're approaching language and literacy for students from diverse populations and how we're following that up. It's not only like, oh, this looks good. Okay, here's my syllabus. No, it's how is that delivered and implemented and what's the outcome in that classroom and the impact. That's what we really need to be doing. We're looking for impact and what we have done. And so that is essential. And so I'm delighted to have the opportunity to work with uh, some organizations that are working with state departments, getting them all to talk to one another, higher education university institutions, working on really making sure that their professors are delivering um, these comprehensive approaches and so that uh, our future teachers know exactly. So when they come out, will they know exactly what they need to know uh, for um, you know, delivering instruction in that, uh, in those classrooms. And, uh, it's exciting to see that the states, many, many states are, are trying to get this work done as well as many universities. And I think, you know, what success breeds success. So when these, when these states continue, like the Mississippi story continues to show these success, well, you know, what did they do? How can we do better? Or these institutions of higher education that are preparing the teachers that are the most highly qualified, you know, what are they doing? And I think once, you know, we have many, many, um, you know, examples of awesome uh, you know, instruction for these teachers. And I think the more we work together in a collaborative manner, the better for um, all students, including those learning English as an additional language. Thank you for that. And I, I want to reiterate that piece of the cultural and linguistic responsive, that responsiveness that you said, and particularly the cultural responsiveness piece, right, is that again, this is an integrated comprehension approach, comprehensive approach, right? Where cultural responsiveness is going to motivate, it's going to make a child feel like they're seen, they're heard, that they belong. And I think that's a really important facet of within a structured literacy, linguistically re responsive approach to this. Um, and so I appreciate you talking about that. And I wish we had another hour to talk about those elements, but um, you know, maybe you just have to come back. Um, but, you know, talk about a way to empower as we started we started with empowerment and strengths and now we're we're ending with empowerment and collaboration from the classroom from the teacher to the child to the family approach to all the way to state apart departments and organizations so i appreciate that um we have two minutes so is there anything that you'd like to share beyond your hopes your calls for the future of research education advocacy in education at large so um, I'm thrilled about getting to work um, and looking at how we screen children uh, from uh, diverse populations that represent other home languages other than English. I'm excited about that work. Uh, right now at the University of Houston, we have a model demonstration project for uh, dyslexia, and I'm excited about that work as we work in schools. And we're working in really trying to build those network improvement communities and really making sure that everything that we do is, you know, sustainable and scalable and that it has great uh, impact and very diligently working on accreditation of um, universities. I know the International Dyslexia Association is very much, uh, you know, focused on that. There's a project called The Path Forward to work with state departments. Um, I'm excited about that work, excited about working with state departments. I'm excited also that, you know, the pandemic was something so terrible, but it was during the pandemic that, for example, say Texas reached out and said, you know, what can we do, you know, to help, uh, you know, students who don't speak English, speak Spanish, what can we help them that struggle? And from that came this pilot project of really accrediting and, and, and certifying, uh, you know, bilingual dyslexia specialists. And I'm excited about that as well. I want all teachers to know how to work with multilingual students. And then I especially want, um, you know, for those students who struggle, that they have access to the most highly qualified professional that knows what to do, when to do, how to do, and why they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're going to be, we're raising thinking educators that have deep knowledge and uh, can really 
deliver and have great impact so that we can really have literacy for all. And you've heard me probably say that literacy is the bridge to equity. And we're working diligently on that access and that equity for our students. And I'm so grateful and thankful to be here today to share what we know, to talk about what we need to do. And I, I, I you know, my, most of my day is spent in volunteer work and, and um, but this is, I think it's my passion. And, um, you know, when you have knowledge, there's a responsibility. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that. Literacy is the bridge to equity. And when you have knowledge, there is a responsibility. So we must go out and reach and teach all children. And when we know, when you know something, when you know better, you must do better. And I say it's not business as usual anymore. From, from this conversation, you've learned not to do business as usual. You've learned about some extra things that you have to do that are essential for these students so that they can achieve literacy and meet their life streams. Mm. Dr. Elsa Cardenas Hagen. I am beyond grateful for this conversation. Thank you for being on the Read podcast and sharing your expertise and your insights. I, I, I just want to just sit in, in this inspiration and your expertise. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank much. you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate thank it. You. Mm, I am savoring those words from Dr. Elsa Cardenas Hagen. Literacy is the bridge to equity. And when we have the knowledge, it is our responsibility to do something with that knowledge. You can learn about Dr. Hagen's work and my top read bookmarks or top moments from each episode by visiting each episode page at readpodcast.org. As you learn from our read experts, I invite you to check out the Windward Institute's fall community lecture and our professional development offerings featuring core reading and language classes and brand new learning bundles on reading comprehension. If you have any thoughts, questions, or ideas of topics and speakers, feel free to reach out via email at info at readpodcast.org. I also invite you to like, subscribe, and share the Read Podcast with friends and colleagues. And that includes rating the Read Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also like or follow the Windward Institutes and Windward Schools social media pages to find out more about upcoming speakers, episodes, and events. Until next time, readers. 